basically, as we see it, their new task is to leave this dimension or this plane of the face of the Earth with their total awareness, with their total life force. On one level, I guess you could interpret it as it's, it's their time to die, but it's, it's not death as we know it. They're not going to be buried in the ground. They're not, their bodies will not decompose. Instead, like Kylie has said, through all their 30 years of self-discipline, and as their level of awareness has raised to the fullest to fulfill their luminous egg, their bodies will burn with the fire within, adding to their awareness, and they will leave. I had originally planned to begin this video with an excerpt of my dad talking about Carlos Castaneda's philosophy, but even he himself, as someone who has studied it for 40 years, struggled to explain it and struggled to, to wrap his head around what he still believed in so firmly. And that's what's really fascinating about Carlos Castaneda to me, is that people cannot explain why they are so enamored with his ideas, with his imagery. But even my mom, who is extremely skeptical, uh, is enticed by his prose and it really is the mark of someone who is an extremely successful manipulator someone who has a, a gravity about them that attracts even the most skeptical people to believe in some of the most ridiculous things growing up carlos castaneda was just another fairy tale to me my dad kept a copy of Tales of Power in the glove compartment of his car, and I'd read it whenever I had to wait for him. And of course, as a child, I believed it. As I grew up, he became something else, kind of an urban legend. Like all myths, I didn't put that much thought into it, till one day I was doing research into unsolved mysteries and I heard the name drop. Carlos Castaneda. Carlos Castaneda, I thought, you know, what's his mystery? The answer isn't easy because... There's no one mystery. There is an infinite number of facts to question, of questions to ask, of blanks where answers should be, and time isn't healing like it's supposed to, and there are people who need closure. So, I don't know where to start except to answer the one question I can. Why did any of this happen? Simply, Castaneda got popular in the first place because his philosophy fit perfectly with the culturally, sexually, and spiritually open mindset of the late 1960s. Castaneda gave meaning to the visions people would experience under the influence of psychedelics. He gave purpose. What you saw when you were tripping was a trip, he professed. One to another dimension. Peyote, Datura, Jimson weed shrooms were used by Castaneda ritualistically, despite this not being present in the shamanistic practices of the Yaqui. In fact, none of Castaneda's facts were based on contemporary Yaqui culture, and Don Juan Matus, Castaneda's possibly fictitious Yaqui Toltec shaman, didn't resemble physically or culturally either of the groups he was purportedly an expert in. So who was Don Juan Matus, a real person or an amalgamation of Native American and indigenous Mexican beliefs, practices, and cultural aspects, assembled in a manner to make ignorant people desperate for an excuse to get high, take an interest in New Age spiritualism? Castaneda presented two different stories of how he met Don Juan, but adherents argue that the Bible canonically contradicts itself at points, and yet it still holds spiritual merit. So, is that what Don Juan is? A metaphor, an allegory, a pseudonym for Castaneda's own conscience, a real man who was a con artist, or a genuine shaman? Castaneda's first wife believed it was a reference to a wine they mutually enjoyed, Mateus. But could the answer really be so mundane? There is one person who may know. Castaneda was accompanied on his road trip by a colleague, sometimes called Bill. In Castaneda's first narrative, he claims Bill introduced him to Don Juan, and one theory posits Bill did in fact make an introduction, since, as many Spanish speakers have pointed out, in Castaneda's native language, Spanish, there is a word cargar which has several meanings. One is to debt, book, or charge to an account, in other words, to Bill. In another use, the same word framed in other contexts means to be intoxicated. 
If Bill was a real person, not just a personification of drug-fueled introspection, he may have been William Lawrence Campbell, a UFO enthusiast, pot prospector, and grisly wild man. Or he may have been mentally ill or a predator looking for an excuse to get Castaneda into a vulnerable position. Something about him certainly seems questionable, if not his character, his information. The validity of the teachings presented in Castaneda's first book were questioned almost immediately upon its publication in 1968, but criticism didn't gain ground till four years later, when author Joyce Carol Oates personally complained to the New York Times that they had classified Castaneda's books as non-fiction. She was joined in her skepticism by Richard DeMille, who devoted himself to proving that Castaneda was, in his words, one of the greatest intellectual hoaxers of all time. So what was the conclusion of DeMille's investigation? Two books, Castaneda's Journey and The Don Juan Papers, both well received by academics and respected for their detailed notes, sources, bibliographies, and the contributions of 30 other learned people. The most important thing DeMille discovered during his research was that Castaneda was getting his information from somewhere. He was stealing it. He wasn't just making things up, but he wasn't teaching from the Yaqui like he claimed. He was cherry-picking information from literary and scientific writers. He was plagiarizing. But Castaneda was a trickster, just as conniving as the creatures he purported in folklore. He was peak hypocritical. His books would make the bestseller list despite being countercultural. He would live a rich life despite deriding materialistic aspirations. And he would emphasize cutting off outside influence, while at the same time instructing his readers to be open to everything. Now, this is where I make the distinction between readers, followers, and members. Readers were people like my father. Followers were those who attended lectures and practiced Castaneda's methods. And members? Those were those who practiced Tenzingredi. Tenzingredi was Castaneda's philosophy rebranded and repackaged in the 1970s, but it didn't catch on until the 90s, when he began to market it as a perfected form of modern shamanism. He emphasized it was pure, pre-Columbian, free from Catholic influences. He played up the mysticism of this, but kept it more rational than his previous eclectic beliefs. Tenzingridi was managed by Clear Green, a company that still exists today and markets itself as Castaneda's successor. Thousands of people still believe in Castaneda's philosophy. You see quotes of his on Pinterest, Instagram models reading his books, bohemian acolytes talking about how he's the father of the New Age movement, and this is no different than it was before Castaneda's death. He had devotees of his own, though, as few people know, these unfortunate men and women would not receive the answers they were seeking, and instead would be left with an abundance of questions. Let's start with the first puzzle piece. Let's meet Carlos Castaneda's witches. In 1973, Castaneda purchased a large property in LA where he lived with his students. The five we need to focus on are Amelia Marquez, Kylie Luntal, Taisha Ablar, Florinda Donner, and Patricia Parton. They go by many different names in an impossible chronology, but these are what I'll be referring to them as. These girls were collectively known as the chalk mules, an odd term considering a chalk mule is a term for a pre-Columbian Mesoamerican statue that faces the viewer. One possibility of why Castaneda referred to them as such was because, and I quote, he told Florinda that an ancient statue of an idol was of her. He told her she was 7,000 years old. The women were anthropology students, all of them met him at UCLA, and all would drop out without finishing their degree, with the exception of Ablar, who would gain a PhD in the same field as her idol, anthropology. We know almost nothing about their life with Castaneda. The veil of secrecy across the witches was an iron curtain, but what we do know is that they were all his lovers, and in 1995, he adopted Parton as his daughter. Parton was the highest ranking woman. They found her car in Panamint Dunes, and in 2006, her bones were identified in the same desert. Her body was the only one ever found. The only evidence that remained besides her partial skeleton were ripped shreds of pink jogging pants. The only disappearance that was investigated was Marquesa's, who was last seen three days prior to her 40th birthday, in April of 1998. But let's backtrack. What happened in April of 1988? 
On April 27th of 98, Castaneda died of liver cancer. He was emaciated, sickly, feeble, and likely in an attempt not to undermine his public image, he was given no public funeral, and news of his death wasn't made public till June of that year. Castaneda was a proclaimed sorcerer, a man who had gained fame for a philosophy based on the ingestion of hallucinogens and psychotics, and yet that was what contributed in at least some part to his death. Not good for business. So what about Tenzin Gritty, his philosophy, and the people who were managing all this, Clear Green? What did they have to say about the women's disappearances or Castaneda's death? Quote, They are not going to appear personally at the Tenzin Gritty workshops. But Clear Green is not one person, and it didn't disband when Castaneda and his witches left. There was an enormous amount of infighting in the group even before April of 1998, and the majority of it came not from Castaneda, as you would expect, but from Parton, who was known and feared as Blue Scout. Corey Donovan, creator of Castaneda debunking website Sustained Action, gives us some insight into the interpersonal dynamics of Clear Green. Many of the junior Clear Green people, and others who briefly came into Castaneda's inner circle over the last several years, were, quote, terrorized, unquote, by having to pass approval by the supposed Blue Scout. Nuri Alexander, also known as Parton, was held up to others in the group as a superior, perfect being, not really human in nature. The prevalent impression was that if Nuri did not like you, you were out. Castaneda also used Nuri as a threat with the Sunday group for some months, claiming that if word got out about the sessions and a disapproving Blue Scout learned about them, it would be ended in a flash. Parton was the de facto leader of the Chalk Mules. Castaneda told her that she was more than 7,000 years old, regarded her as daughter, mother, and lover, and called her his little girl. This is just a glimpse into the strange dynamic between Castaneda and his witches. Donovan alerts us to more courtesy of Amy Wallace, another of Castaneda's lovers. Quote, One of Castaneda's control methods was to personally give haircuts. If someone was out of favor, he would refuse to cut her hair, nor was anyone allowed to cut it. So, among the harem, a shaggy head of hair was a badge of shame. When the Nogul eventually tired of a bedmate, she'd be assigned to someone new for him. Amy Wallace uses the word pimping. Castaneda had a great pickup line, quote, You're the electric warrior, unquote. He told Wallace and, as she later learned, others. Just put yourself in the place for a minute. A great man transforms your meeting into an event of cosmic significance. He reveals your true essence. You are mythical, messianic entity, the one who will complete the magic circle, the team of otherworldly superheroes. The great man says, You're the one we've been waiting for, the creature to guide us to infinity. Who could resist? In a sustained action discussion group, a woman described how she was approached first at a class. Castaneda whispered in her ear, quote, You have a very good energy, unquote. Then, one of his staff called her with an invitation to a secret, private class, where she would be placed in the front row directly facing Castaneda. She was called again by one of the inner circle women with a request from Castaneda, may he call her at home. She was asked for the day and time of her birth so the witches could cast her astrological chart. Castaneda himself told her that, through astrology, he had discovered that she was significant to his group and his cause. Castaneda's objectification of women was dictatorial. Amy Wallace wrote, Taisha had spent years with Carlos's favorite electrolysis removing all her hair. He dispatched me to Faye to create a perfect bikini line. He insisted it was magically critical that I shave my pubic hair in certain ways. His directions altered over time. Carlos insisted, quote, This is of the utmost sorceric importance. You must shave the lower half of your conchita. It will allow the energy to flow smoothly and make you less human, unquote. Wallace was given the unusual privilege of wearing shorter skirts and higher heels than the others. Castaneda's systematic method of controlling his followers is nothing out of line for a cult. Cult leaders often micromanage their devotees in order to create a dependence on them, on their guidance, on their control. It is analogous to an abusive relationship because it is one, and it was backed up by Castaneda's twisted logic, which Formites close to Castaneda still struggle to explain. Quote, 
According to Castaneda, there are two kinds of people. A bored fuck is someone whose mother was not orgasmic in association with that particular act. The consequence to the child, when she or he grows up, he or she may be celibate in order to follow the warrior shaman path. On the other hand, a non-bored fuck is obviously someone whose mother was sexually satisfied on the occasion of conception. Anyone who started out as a non-bored fuck is born with plenty of energy, so when they grow up, they can have all the sex they want. Anytime he met someone, Castaneda had the power to suss out whether that person was a bored fuck or a non-bored fuck. By a strange happenstance, only the Nagul himself and very, very few other people were entitled to have sex. He was openly judgmental of a woman guru who admitted to having an erotic life. If a woman had sex with the Nagul, Castaneda, his sperm would reach her brain and alter it into something superior to human. Also, any other man she had sex with in the future would receive magical benefits of an unimaginable quality, but none of these women were expected to have sex with another man in the future. On the contrary, the boss wanted them to be eternally faithful to him, so in practical terms, no one should have a chance to test out whether, like the flu, those magical benefits could be passed around. There are creatures who have evil intentions towards us. They are known as flyers. A human baby girl is born with a horizontal bar of energy, Castaneda said, which the flyers immediately take a big bite from. This could only be repaired by, you guessed it, having sex with Carlos Castaneda. But sexual healing didn't repair Castaneda's liver cancer, so what gives? Why was he immune to his own medicine? Or did his medicine leave him? After all, we don't know the exact date his witches disappeared, just that it was after he died. It's hard to find anything exact about the girl's disappearances, but I did find an account that says Florinda was seen the day after Castaneda's death. So we know that she was alive as of April 28th. An article on Acid Heroes sourced from Wallace says that it was likely before May 2nd when they failed to appear at a pre-scheduled workshop. No one could find them, no one could contact them. The girls disconnected their phones and simply vanished. This was not entirely unexpected, as Wallace notes, quote, One of the witches, Ablar, flew to Florida to inspect yachts. Gabby Guter, in notes taken at the time, wondered, Why are they buying a boat? Maybe Carlos wants to leave with his group and disappear unnoticed into the wide open oceans. Guter wasn't one of the girls who went missing. She was rejected from the core group and kept on the fringes, and eventually she became something like a stalker, even going through Castaneda's trash and filming him. She actually filmed the witches packing up their things before they disappeared, before Castaneda died. They had this all planned, clearly, but who is they? Castaneda, Clear Green, Parton, and what was it? An organized suicide, victims waiting to escape their abuser, some type of new age shedding of past identities. After all, Castaneda demanded that in his followers. Guter herself notes that Castaneda's death was boring, that they didn't expect such a mundane death for such a mystical man, that they thought he would leave with more than that. Maybe the witches wanted to leave with more than that. It certainly seems that way. Via Acid Heroes, sourced from a forum written primarily by Wallace. In Castaneda's last days, Lundhal warned him that some of his people might commit suicide. To fill the emptiness, she recommended that he assign people specific tasks to carry out once he was dead. She was talking about not only the tight inner group, but the followers who ran and worked for his organization, Clear Green. It must have surprised Lundhal when the boss told her he didn't care what happened to Clear Green. But she managed to change his mind to an extent and she did assign jobs to people, as she had suggested. So, what do these survivors say? Kim Parton, sister of Patricia Parton, said, Just read about my sister, Patty. Glad to see she is being exposed for what she is, a complete and utter phony, not to mention a con artist. Among her other attributes, I consider her to be a murderess. She kills people in her mind. She killed me and she killed my family. She has false memories of a horrible childhood that simply did not exist. To think that people had to hold themselves up to her as the perfect being is laughable. I could not think of a more twisted, hateful, or sick being, although the part about her being not human does ring true. Rena Kepler, a woman Castaneda once attempted to groom, said, I could have easily died of my exhaustion and depression, but I regret not calling my father for a few days, as he died three days earlier after I returned from LA. This was at Castaneda's instruction. I guess my point here is just gratitude. I have found a path with heart, my own heart, and I value the books and the wisdom no matter what its source. 
I did love Carlos, I truly did, and I am shocked by all these posts which validate my feelings. I thought this was a cult and stopped going. Happened right after Heaven's Gate. The similarities were appalling. E.B., a once devoted fan, wrote, I read Carlos's books for 35 years, and for 35 years I believed every word I read, so it was a shock to realize he was as mortal as any ordinary man. I still believe there was a Don Juan, but Carlitos did not make the grade. When he realized he was going to die, he decided to teach Tenzin Gritty in an attempt to get energy from all of us, not for monetary gain or for power as I had originally believed. In order to con us, he and his cohorts had to weave an incredibly deceptive yarn. So does that yarn hold up? Is there any merit in the teachings of a hypocritical man who couldn't even practice his own philosophy? Let me know what you think in the comments below.